Good afternoon, sports fans, and welcome to today's episode on Spectacle and Christianity in the Late Roman Empire. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are moving into the twilight of the empire to look at what happens to Roman spectacle as Rome shifts from a pagan empire to a Christian empire. Now, we saw in previous lectures that the gladiatorial games, the chariot races, and the beast hunts of imperial Rome served not only to entertain the masses, but kind of also to reinforce the social structure and the imperial might of this overarching empire. And now, as the Roman Empire progresses into its twilight years, sport and spectacle change for a variety of reasons. One of the big ones being, they just became way, way, way too expensive as the economy of the ancient Roman Empire began to crumble and things like wild exotic beasts became rarer and rarer, more difficult to obtain. But another reason emerged as well. Spectacles were often frowned upon by a small religious sect that had only recently seen itself rise to power, namely the Christians. And yet despite these changes, spectacle, especially chariot racing, persisted for centuries. So whether you're looking to govern a rapidly changing empire or you're looking to grow your own religion, journey with me as we investigate Christianity and late Roman spectacle. started as a niche mystical religion within the larger Roman Empire. And Rome was pretty cool with this from the start. In fact, one of the main reasons that Rome was so successful as an empire is that it was fairly accepting of foreign religions. The general rule was, feel free to bring your own religion into the Roman Empire. Just make sure you worship the emperor as well, and don't forget to pay your taxes. And with those kind of rules, you can start to see where this Christian religious belief, right, a monotheistic ideology, starts to conflict with Rome's approach to things. Now, during the first couple centuries CE, Christians didn't register on the Roman imperial radar to a very large degree. So you get a few executions, right, the most famous being that of St. Peter, who was crucified upside down in the Circus of Nero, which later became the site of St. Peter's Basilica up on the kind of northwestern side of the Tiber River in Rome. We now call that region the Vatican. Anyway, most other evidence, however, suggests that Christianity just wasn't a very big deal early on. So Pliny the Younger writes to the Emperor Trajan about what to do with Christians. And Trajan, writing around 100 CE, basically says, look, give them every chance to worship the throne, right? To worship the emperor. Don't go seeking them out. Don't go trying to persecute them. Give them the chance to worship the emperor, pay their taxes, and try to smooth things over there. But by the third century CE, the number of Christians had grown. And this was just happening as Rome's power was starting to decrease. Now, political instability, combined with financial troubles, were causing problems in the capital, and the Christians, they made an easy scapegoat. So Diocletian went on something of a Christian rampage before his successor, a guy you might know as Constantine, eventually made Christianity okay after apparently seeing a vision in the sky. Right? This was before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge in 312, as Constantine tried to take sole control of the Roman Empire, 
he apparently had a vision in his dream the night before the battle with the sign of Christ, the Cairo at the time. And he had all his soldiers paint this on their armor and on their shields. He went out, won that battle, and in the aftermath, made Christianity acceptable within the Roman Empire. Now, as the capital moved from the city of Rome eastward to Constantinople in modern-day Istanbul, Christianity began to thrive. And by the latter part of the 4th century AD, Christianity wasn't just thriving, it was the state religion in the Roman Empire. And it would continue that way as Rome gave way to the Byzantine Empire in the east and then throughout the birth, the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire in the West. Now, as early Christians continued to defy imperial mandate, a good handful found their way into the arena to be executed. And how ancient writers viewed these people very much depended on their own position at the time. So many of the Christian writers look back at these people as martyrs, right? People who died for their faith. While most pagan Romans at the time would have viewed this in pretty much the same way as executing any other criminal in the arena, usually at lunchtime, between the beast hunts in the morning and the gladiatorial games in the afternoon, just another way to entertain the masses. The Romans, as we just mentioned, didn't pay much attention to Christians for almost like 200 years or so at the beginning of the development of that faith. Christian authors, however, viewed Christian executions as worthy tales to be told. But often, these were recounted centuries after the death of the martyr, and certainly with a very deep religious bias. And it wasn't just the executions that kept early Christians from the games. The Christian author Tertullian, writing around 200 CE, called the games idolatrous, right? Meaning that these spectacles led to the near worship of fighters, in battles, in violence in the arena, clearly incompatible with the idea of worshiping a single divine being. So it wasn't just the violence they condemned, it was that the spectacles took their focus away from that one God and salvation. Now, Greek sport was to an extent more acceptable to early Christians. Jesus was part man after all and had an earthly body, and we do see mentions of working out and training within Christian literature. And despite Christian attitudes towards the games, the spectacles themselves weren't really affected for those first few centuries of our era. And it's a little weird how well-informed Christian writers seem to be about the games, right? When they write about them, they seem to know quite a lot. So perhaps they attended a few more than were made to believe. Now, it's not like Christians were the first monotheistic religion in Rome, and they weren't the first monotheistic religion Rome had to deal with. They'd, be deal they'd been dealing with Jewish people for centuries prior to this at this point. They did, however, find Christian faith a little bit weird. I mean, they're worshiping an executed criminal and drinking his blood and eating his body? Sounds pretty weird when you frame it like that. Anyway, Christians first come onto the scene in Roman author to Roman authors when Nero uses them as a scapegoat for the great fire in Rome in 64 CE. Thereafter, coming up with all sorts of creative ways for them to be executed in the arena. Now, most authors find them sort of odd, Christians sort of odd and a little bit off-putting, in part because they don't participate in the games like a good Roman should. And Nero's persecu uh, persecution was the exception rather than the rule. We already talked about how Pliny the Younger's letters to the Emperor Trajan show Romans preferred to really kind of just not deal with Christians. You know, have them make sacrifices to the imperial cult to show that they are indeed Roman, and then just let them be. But by the 3rd century AD, however, right, Christians had grown somewhat in numbers and increasingly bore the brunt of imperial persecution. Things weren't going great for the Roman Empire during this time, and Christians, they just made an easy scapegoat, right? Especially when they refused to sacrifice to the imperial cult. And while Tertullian gives us a Christian-based account of many of the persecutions, it's important to remember that the Romans saw this as going against their own religious beliefs and against the traditional social order in Roman society, potentially creating problems for Roman society at large. So let's take a look at a few of the famous martyrs from ancient Rome. So first up, we have the martyrdom of Blandina at Lugdunum, modern-day Lyon in France, quite a delightful city. 
Although not for Blandina, apparently. Anyway, this happened in 177 CE. So her story is recounted by the Roman historian and Christian historian Eusebius, writing in the 4th century CE, about 150 to maybe 200 years after the death of Blandina. Now, Blandina was part of a group of Christians executed in the arena. They were tied to posts to have wild animals set upon them, right? Remember, we called this the damnatio ad bestias. But the animals wouldn't attack Blandina, not until they exposed her to a bull who did then eventually kill her. I guess her luck ran out there. Anyway, the bodies were left there to be eaten by animals, and then burned, and then thrown into the river to prevent resurrection. Really a harsh way to treat Christians at the time. Several decades later, we have the martyrdom of a woman named Perpetua, a woman from Carthage in 203 CE. Now, Perpetua and her fellow Christians, they refused to wear cloaks of the pagan gods when entering the arena. And within the arena, they bravely endured their punishment. They goaded the animals to attack, and then when they survived those attacks, Perpetua even helped the gladiator tasked with killing her bring his sword to her own throat. Now, the Roman spectators didn't seem to be big fans of the Christian approach to being executed. So the Christian author, Oregon, says that the crowds got bored when Christians would calmly endure the executions, but they'd go crazy when Christians broke their composure and cried out. Now, this bravery and calmness seems to be one of the constant characteristics of Christians in the arena, at least the way Christian authors tell the story. And their eagerness to die for their faith flew in the face of the goal of, of public Roman punishments, right? With that goal being to deter people from committing crimes uh, that brought them into the arena in the first, first place. So it seems that these may have actually had the opposite effect, right? Exposing more people to Christianity, having people think, wow, what is it about these people that makes them so brave in the face of danger? And then perhaps even helping it grow its numbers through that exposure. Now, while it's tempting to think that the game simply disappeared as a moral mandate once Christianity took over the Roman Empire, well, that simply just wasn't the case. They continued on, at least for some time, but they do kind of slowly wane uh, due to a combination of economic and religious and logistical factors. Now, we mentioned earlier that Christians weren't as opposed to Greek sport as they were to Roman spectacle. And while that may be true, they also had their fair share of problems with Greek sport as well especially if they felt the body was being worshipped in a way that took away their focus from God, right? Nonetheless, the Olympics seem to have endured for quite some time, and recent discoveries of a new victor list at Olympia show that games were still going on as late as 385 CE. And an inscription from Rome shows that the Athletes Synod, or the Athletes Guild, was still going on all the way up until 392 CE, more than half a century after Constantine made Christianity okay within the Roman world. Now, it used to be thought that Constantine ended the gladiatorial games, but a deeper look shows that he simply ended the practice of using convicts to fight each other. The games went on. The emperor Honorius supposedly closed the gladiatorial schools in Rome in 399 CE, and then he's the one who actually ended the games in 404 CE. But once again, even after that date of 404, we still have some evidence for games continuing, at least in the western part of the Roman Empire, for decades longer after that. Eventually, however, the combination of religious and economic problems did bring an end to the games. Now, Romans didn't really have a problem with the beast shows, right? The killing of beasts. At least when the beasts were fighting beasts or men were fighting beasts, right? Not when beasts were eating people. Uh, so they didn't have a problem with those in the same way they had a problem with the gladiatorial games. The problem, though, is that Rome had been putting on these beast shows for hundreds of years at this point, killing thousands upon thousands of wild animals. And now those animals? Well, obviously, they were becoming harder and harder to find. You couldn't just go round up 400 lions anymore as easily as you could 300 years earlier. Nonetheless, these beast hunts did continue into the 6th century CE. One of the cool things is that it looks like the beast shows actually changed by the 6th century CE as well. So rather than hunting the beasts, archaeological evidence suggests that it was more akin to like bullfighting without the actual fighting. So athletes would sort of bait the animals, right? Tempt the animals, get them to charge, right? Imagine a matador with a red cape. 
And then at the last minute, they would leap out of the way using poles or ropes or baskets or other mechanical devices. So it's kind of interesting how this harkens back to the bull leaping. If you remember at the beginning of this course, right, in the no and bull leaping, it kind of seems like, seems like we see a almost reemergence of that sort of acrobatic approach uh, to beasts in the arena. Uh, and it also kind of looks forward then to the bullfighting of modern Spain. An interesting connection between kind of looking backwards to the past and forwards uh, to the present. Now, even though Christians had fewer problems with chariot racing than they did with gladiatorial games, these two declined eventually. And this in large part is what suggests economic problems were just as big as the moral problems with the games. The last race we know of in Rome was held in the middle of the 6th century CE, the middle of the 500 CE. But in the East, in the Greek East, right, it appears that chariot ra racing lasted all the way up until the 11th century CE, right? The 1000 CE was still going on. And there, it still served as a place for factions, right, remember the different chariot racing teams, to publicly view and address the emperor in Constantinople, who had, once again, his own private box at the games. Now, spectators seem to have been rather more violent in watching the games in Constantinople. And we have evidence for fights breaking out amongst the factions, just like a modern day soccer game. There were a famous set of riots, the most famous set, known as the Nikkei riots in 532 CE. Now, one suggested cause of this riot was the tension between the blue and the green factions. It might have actually arisen out of competition between these two. Uh, especially because the emperor was supporting the blue faction. You know, another uh, take on this says that it was the massive taxation levied by the emperor Justinian, who uh, may have also had something to do with it. Anyway, after six days of chaos, the emperor and his army killed about 30,000 people in order to bring this riot to an end. And so with the rise of Christianity, we do eventually get the decline of ancient sport and spectacle as we know it. But it wasn't clear-cut and immediate, right? Eventually, religious values, issues of scarcity, and economic problems, they all contributed to bring the games to an end. And with this end, we also see the end of classical culture more broadly, right? The Greek and Roman way of doing things, the Greek and Roman culture that we get in the classical period in the Roman Empire, right? What we get our word classics from, those things eventually dissipate over time and give way to a new Christian way of doing things. So whether they knew it or not at the time, the legacy of sport and spectacle in the classical world and what that left behind would flourish once again in the modern world, right? From the rebirth of the ancient Olympics to the 100,000 plus fans at a football game, right? To races around mile long tracks with motorized chariots, right? With we call cars, uh, we seem just as enthralled by this sort of competition and spectacle as the Greeks and Romans were centuries and millennia earlier. So we've already taken a look at the intersection between religion and sport in the Greek world. And we've considered how religion continues to be present in the world of modern sport as well, right? So, for example, even though the Olympics might not be put on in honor of Zeus anymore, we can see that religion hasn't gone away, right? You can still see uh, religion in the jewelry that athletes wear, the celebrations they do after they score, the shout outs they give as MVP of the big game, right? Couldn't have done this without God. Uh, but the question then is how do we translate this kind of way of thinking um, to the role that Christianity specifically played within sport and spectacle at the end of the Roman Empire, right? Sort of bringing this to a close. Well, we don't really have many modern sports uh, coming to a complete stop as the result of a major religious movement. But one way to think about this might be to look at instances where sport and spectacle uh, and religion end up colliding and conflicting with one another rather than examples where they're meshing well together. Now, frequently, these conflicts play out on an individual level rather than on a team or a sport level. So let's start in the world of basketball. It was 1995, and Michael Jordan was off somewhere playing baseball for the Birmingham Barons, and Hakeem Olajuwon was on his way to winning his first MVP. Only one problem, though. Hakeem Olajuwon was a practicing Muslim, and as such, he was observing Ramadan, a holy holiday that fell that year during the month of May 
right when the NBA playoffs were taking place. Now, during Ramadan, players can't eat and they can't drink, not even water, or take medicine from sunrise to sunset, meaning that they potentially couldn't eat before games or even drink water during games. Nonetheless, Hakeem played, and he played well on his way to winning not just the MVP, but also his first NBA championship. Other examples are less well-known, but they're similar in nature. So we get Sean Green, an outfielder for the Dodgers back in 2004, and he was criticized for skipping games in order to observe the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur. And another example, we have a college wrestler, a guy by the name of Muhammad McBride, who was banned from competition for not shaving his face, a practice that he attributed to his devout Muslim faith. So we might not have a perfect parallel here, right, to Christianity bringing down the games in classical antiquity uh, and religion kind of cutting off entire sports from their existence, but we certainly do get examples of that kind of conflict between sports and religion in the modern world as well. All right, you have made it to the end of another episode. And in today's lecture, we have looked at the evolution of sport and spectacle in the latter part of the Roman Empire. And we've seen that the growth of Christianity, right? Once this fledgling mystery religion, just a tiny little thing on the outskirts of Rome's Eastern Empire, it eventually brought both the gladiatorial games and Greek-style athletic events, including the Olympics, to a complete halt. Nonetheless, spectacle persisted, and chariot racing was more popular than ever by the reign of Justinian in the 6th century CE, 200 years after Rome moved its capital from Italy to Constantinople in modern-day Turkey. And it would remain popular for another five centuries until the 11th century CE. So next time you get a major cultural shift, don't sweat the small stuff. Make sure to adapt and keep those chariot wheels rolling. Just a couple lessons you can learn from Christianity and late Roman spectacle.